Okay, thank you very much, Bernard, and uh, thank you also very much uh, for inviting me. Um, as the title already suggests, this will be mostly about theory, so I guess the math content will be a bit more than in the previous uh, courses you have heard, and uh, therefore I decided I start with a somewhat informal introduction and then slowly develop uh, the uh, main concepts and questions, and then after having uh, talked about the uh, main questions, we will then have a look at a very particular learning algorithm and see how we can analyze it. Okay, so let us begin with an informal description of uh, supervised learning. For supervised learning, we have a space or a set X of input samples and a set Y of labels or output information and we assume that we have a relationship between the inputs and the outputs and the informal goal is that we want to learn the relationship between the inputs and the outputs and to this end we have some data data is of the form input sample output sample input sample output sample and we assume here that we have finitely many of them, usually n of these samples. And as I already mentioned, uh, we like to learn from this data D. And uh, learning means that we, we try to find a function f from the inputs to the outputs. Outputs are here in this talk always elements of the real numbers, such that this function we try to find estimates or predicts the output y for a new unseen x in a good way. Yeah, what good means, this is one of the things we have to develop in the next couple of slides. Um, for now, I just uh, like to say that a learning method then is something, usually an algorithm, that constructs to every data set D such a predictor. Yeah? Whether this predictor is good or not doesn't really matter. It's just something which constructs to every data set a predictor. Okay. So one of the most classical learning problems is binary classification. Here our output information is just plus or minus one or equivalently, let's say, zero and one. This doesn't really matter. The point here is that we only have two different labels and our goal is to find a predictor which makes as few mistakes as possible for the labels on future data. So here's an illustration. We have some samples. The labels are indicated by the color and this is our training set, yeah? a subset of R2 and then we try to find a predictor. A predictor, in this case, could be a line which predicts green on the left-hand side and red on the right-hand side. And in this case, I drew a predictor which makes no mistakes at all on the training set. Yeah? So this is a predictor working well on the training set, but actually it doesn't matter at all how it works on the training set. The only question or the only goal we have is that this predictor works well on the on future samples. So here are future samples um, with the same characteristics as the um, training set and what we see here now is that uh, in this very particular case this predictor makes three mistakes on the future samples. And what we want to do is we want to find a predictor which works well on this side, not on this side. This is the only goal we have. We want to find a predictor which works well on future data. So this is probably the easiest uh, supervised learning scenario. And the second classical learning scenario is regression. Here we allow the labels to be any value, any real value, or maybe some bounded real value, this doesn't really matter. And 
then the goal is that we want to estimate the label y again from uh, our data for, for new data x as accurate as possible. Mm. So here again we have some training data. I didn't draw uh, the corresponding uh, predictors uh, here for the training data. In this case, we have a one-dimensional data set. The x space is just the unit interval between 0 and 1. And our labels here in this case are some values between minus 1.5 and 1.5. And on the right-hand side, I drew two predictors, a black one and a red one. And the blue points are, again, future samples, not the ones we have seen in our training set. And now what we want to have is a predictor which works well on this new future data set. And uh, how it works on the training set doesn't really matter. So these are the mm, two most classical uh, um, scenarios. And we mostly will stick to these two when we uh, consider um, our questions. But uh, I'd like to point out that all, everything I, I, I will talk about is rather generic. So rather than considering regression or classification, you can also consider more sophisticated uh, questions as well. OK. So. This was the formal introduction, and the informal introduction. What we now have to do is that we have to formalize that. And formalizing means how uh, describing how our data is generated, the past and the future. And also uh, means that we have to describe what we mean by a good predictor. Yeah, everything I've uh, mentioned so far was uh, rather informal. And uh, here on this slide, I formalize now how the data is generated in our setup. So what we assume here is that we have a probability measure or probability distribution denoted by P. And this P lives on the joint space of X times Y. Yeah? And one can think of uh, P as some random generator which produces pairs of input-output samples. Yeah? And uh, this is the underlying idea of assuming that our data is actually distributed according to P. So we assume here that um, our pairs are sampled from the product distribution, which basically just means that all these pairs are independent and identically distributed with the distribution P. Yeah? So we have n samples which all have which are all sampled from this probability measure P on X times Y. This is how our past data was generated. And we assume that the future samples we will see uh, are also generated in the same way. Yeah, so we assume that all future samples we will ever see are also sampled from P in an IID fashion. Yeah? So both the past and the future samples are generated by P. Um, and here are some consequences of these uh, assumptions. The first one is that if I have a given input X, the label I will see for that x is not necessarily al always the same. It is also random. Yeah? For example, if I consider a classification task, uh, let's say handwritten character recognition, then certain uh, numbers, for example, are not very legible, and uh, therefore some supervisors would call a 9 a 4 and vice versa. If you see my handwriting on the blackboard, there's a lot of noise in it, actually. Okay, so this is the first consequence. 
The second one, and this is very important, is that the past and the future look the same. This is somewhat intuitive if we do not assume that everything we will see in the future is somewhat the same we have seen in the past, then we cannot really expect to learn from the past the future. Yeah? And uh, the assumption here that both sample that both uh, are distributed according to P is actually the device ensuring that the past and the future are in a certain sense the same. And what we also um, have here is that, I mentioned this only very briefly at the beginning, is P is unknown. If we knew P, we could solve the problem very easily, but P is unknown. Yeah? And uh, because we usually assume that P is completely unknown, unlike in parametric statistics, we seek algorithms, learning algorithms, that work well for many or even all distributions P we can think of. Yeah? And what we mean by works well, this is what we have to uh, describe now. And we have seen um, in the two examples at the beginning that for classification, working well is probably something different than for regression, just because of the nature of the labels. Yeah? For classification, we just had to make the right prediction plus or minus one, whereas uh, for regression, one would assume that the closeness of our estimate to the observed label is actually of importance. And um, to make uh, these ideas precise, we need a so-called loss function. A loss function basically is any function, L, which takes input-output pairs and predictions and map these triples to some non-negative real number. And the idea of a loss function is that if I compute this value for an input-output pair and a prediction, then this value here describes the cost or the loss we obtain by predicting the label y by t under the uh, observation x. And the name loss indicates that these values are something bad, so we want to have small values. Um, and this is what I mean here, as the name suggests, we prefer predictions t for which this value is small, ideally always zero. Um, so unlike the distribution P, for to which we have no access to, it's unknown to us, the loss function L is chosen by us. Yeah? We have full control over it. Actually, whenever we choose a loss function L, we automatically also choose a very particular learning problem. And choosing different L's usually lead to different learning problems. So the loss function is actually the device for us to describe which very particular learning problem we want to solve. And we will see a few examples in the next couple of slides. OK, so we've seen on the previous slide that future x and y are random. So it makes sense not to consider this value as it is, but consider averages over these values uh, in order to uh, uh, consider the randomness of the future samples. And this leads to the notion of a risk. OK, what is a risk? So. At the very beginning, I said that we want to find a predictor f, which maps from inputs to outputs. So we fix the predictor f, mapping from x to y, or y is a subset of r. So it, in our case, maps to the real numbers. And 
Then we consider the uh, loss we obtain by predicting the label y by f of x at the point x. This is the loss we've seen on the previous slide. And now we take the average with respect to the distribution p. Yeah? So this is the average loss we obtain by predicting with respect to f. So this is something we want to keep small. But uh, just as a little remark, we can't compute this quantity. Why can't we compute this quantity? Well, there's one unknown in it. P. P is unknown to us, and without knowing P, we have no way to computing our LP of F. But nonetheless, we want to make it small. This is basically the source of the difficulty of learning. Okay, so this is the average loss um, of a predictor. And what we also need is the empirical risk. And the empirical risk is if we replace the distribution P by a data set of length n, we can compute the uh, average um, loss we get by predicting the samples of D by F. And whenever we have a data set D, we can readily compute this quantity. Yeah? It's just a summation and yeah, scaling, basically. So unlike this quantity, which we can never compute, this one can be computed as soon as we have a data set D. Um, so there is a relationship between these two quantities. And this is probably one of the um, most fundamental theorems of probability theory, which is the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers basically says that empirical averages converge to true averages. And uh, in our case, this means that when our sample size d goes to infinity, and we fix a predictor f, then the empirical risk here converges to the true risk. Yeah? So in a sense, this quantity we can't compute, this quantity we can compute, and if we just wait enough, then we can estimate this quantity we can't compute by the one we can compute, if we fix f. And in this sense, if we think of D as our future data, we will see um, the risk of F is nothing else than the long-term average future loss we will get by using F as a predictor. Yeah? So rather than uh, fixing one particular data set of future samples, we think of the scenario where we will see basically infinitely many data sets in the future and then it means that uh, in order to minimize our future loss on a particular data set it suffices to consider uh, predictors whose risk are small in this sense. Okay. So, um, We've seen that we want to have small values of L. We prefer them. This means that we prefer predictors F whose risks are small. And the next, yes, please. Um, no. And this is actually. Yeah, okay. So the question was, if we find a function f, which minimizes the empirical risk, does this function f also minimize the true risk? Um, 
And the answer in short is, and we will get a long answer during this talk, the answer in short is no, but it may be a good, good approximation. And when it is a good approximation, this will be uh, worked out in detail in the following. But uh, the intuition indeed is, yeah, if we want to minimize this one, why don't we use this approximation? And the only reason why we can't do it uh, straight straightforward is that this relation holds for each single f independently. But uh, if we minimize this, then we don't have one single f, but we have an f which depends on d for any loss function, yes. Okay, so we want to minimize the risks, and the next uh, natural object we then need to consider is the so-called base risk, which is just the smallest possible risk. Yeah? So we consider all predictors. This is a technical assumption, just forget it. Um, we consider all predictors. We consider the risk of these predictors, and then take the infimum, or if this infimum is attained, just the minimum. Yeah? So RLP star is the smallest risk we can get by predictors of an arbitrary form. And if this infimum is attained by some function FLP star, then we call this function a base predictor. So a base predictor is a predictor which achieves the smallest possible risk. In general, there is no need for the existence of such a base predictor. And if there is a base predictor, it, does is, it is not necessarily unique. Nonetheless, we uh, denote it in this way. And uh, if there is some ambiguity, I will discuss that further on. Okay, so what is the interpretation of that? So we have a learning algorithm. This learning algorithm, algorithm constructs a predictor for a data set D. And the first thing about this definition is that whatever we take as a learning algorithm, whether this is uh, good or bad, we will never find a learning algorithm which constructs a predictor whose risk is better than the base risk. We can't do better than the base risk. Whatever algorithm we use, there's no chance. So what we then consider is the so-called excess risk of a predictor. So this is the risk of a predictor. This is the smallest possible risk. And what we want to have is a predictor for which this excess risk is close to zero. If it is zero, then we would actually have found a base decision function. In general, we cannot hope to do so, but our goal is to find predictors for which this quantity is close to zero. So this, is, uh, so this was a, a lower bound on how good we can do. There's also an upper bound, which is usually not that much considered in the literature because it's pretty simple, but nonetheless, it gives us some very simple baseline uh, for any learning algorithm. And I call that the best naive risk. So what is the best naive risk? Remember that um, we wanted to find a predictor which uses the input information to predict the output information. Let's assume that we just consider predictors who completely ignore the input information. Yeah? So these are the predictors of this form. They just pick a very just pick one particular real number and then always predict this real number, whatever the input in is. We always predict C. And then we can again consider the uh, best risk of these constant predictors, and we call this the best naive risk. 
Um, this second sentence here is important. If we have the situation that the naive risk and the base risk is equal, are equal, then there's no need to use any fancy learning algorithms because we can simply ignore the input uh, information X and just use very standard, simple statistical methods. Um, so whenever we use some sort of fancy learning algorithm, we implicitly hope that the base risk is smaller than the naive risk. So let's have a look when this quantity is uh, equal. Typically, these two quantities are equal if and only if there is a constant base predictor. Yeah? As soon as we have a base predictor which is constant, then this infimum is equal to the base risk, and therefore we have this, and the converse implication is also pretty straightforward. Um, here's an example where we actually have this equality, and this basically means that the input and the output samples are independent from each other. So whatever uh, input sample I see, it does not influence the outputs. And if this is the case, then one can simply show that these two quantities are the same. And intuitively, this makes sense. If the input information doesn't tell us anything about the outputs, well, we can ignore them. Last but not least, in this case, the converse implication is false, and we will see an example of that in a few minutes. OK, so we have introduced a couple of um, notions. Let us now have a few examples. So the first one is, again, binary classification. And here is probably the simplest way of formalizing binary classification. We, again, consider the labels plus and minus 1. And then consider a loss function, which is independent of x, so we just ignore it. And then give a, predicting, a prediction t the value 0 if y and t have the same sign. And if the sign is different, then we get a loss of 1. Yeah? So... This one basically indicates whether our prediction has the same sign as the label we observe. And the corresponding risk is just the probability of the set of points where the sign of our predictor does not equal our observation y. Yeah? So this is basically the probability that we make a wrong prediction. Um, so this is um, the scenario. And uh, now we have to ask, um, what are the corresponding quantities, the base risk, naive risk, and so on? And uh, let's first consider the um, base risk. To this end, we consider the function eta, which, which does the following. We consider a point x and then ask for the probability that we will observe a positive label at the point x. Yeah? So remember, we uh, see some point x in the input space, and then the label may be plus or minus 1. And in this case, uh, we have a probability, a certain probability we don't know. Uh, that we will observe a positive label at point x, and the probability that we will see a negative sample at this point then is 1 minus eta of x. OK, and then some simple calculations show that the base risk is 
just the expectation of the minimum of eta and 1 minus eta, and f is a base predictor if and only if 2 eta minus 1 times the sine of f is greater than or equal to 0. So what does that mean? This basically means the following. If the probability of having a positive label is greater than a half, then the base predictor should predict a positive label. And if the probability of having a positive label is smaller than a half, we will see fewer positive labels than negative labels at point x in the long run, then we should predict a negative label. And this is exactly what this formula means. Well, and the naive risk, oh by the way, this is the first example where we see that a base predictor is not, no, is not necessarily unique, yeah, because it what only the only thing which matters is the sign of f. Whether we predict 2 or 3 or 4 doesn't matter because we only consider the sign. Well, the naive risk is basically um, everything here except that we have to ignore the uh, spatial information in x. So the naive risk is the minimum of having a positive label or a negative label. And uh, what we see then here is that these two quantities coincide if and only if the function eta is either anywhere greater than or equal than a half or the opposite. Yeah? Whenever we have a situation that we, whatever point x we consider, we know that we will see more positive labels than negative ones, we better predict everywhere one, a positive label. And if we have the situation that we will see everywhere more negative labels than positive labels, of course, we will predict a negative label everywhere. The second mm, example is a regression example. And this is probably the most fundamental Mm, estimation problem in statistics, least squares regression, um, except expecting the mean, but this is basically is, it is expecting the mean as we will see. Um, so we consider the loss function, which again ignores spatial information, and if we observe a label y and predict it by t, we take the difference and square it. Yeah? So this value is small if t is close to y, and it's uh, large if t and y are significantly different. Okay, and then one can consider two um, quantities. The first one is the conditional expectation. So we again fix a point x and then ask for the average label at that point x. Yeah, so do we have some chalk here? No. Ah, great. So here's our point X, and then at this point we may observe a couple of different labels y. And if we just wait long enough, then the average of these observed labels is exactly this conditional expectation. And we can also consider the conditional variance, which is just the variance of this distribution here on the uh, vertical axis. And with the help of these two quantities, we can consider the base risk and the base predictor. We can show rather easily that uh, the conditional expectation is the only base predictor 
and the corresponding base risk is the uh, conditional variance, the, expect the expected conditional variance. And uh, the excess risk, which we want to keep small, is nothing else than the difference of f and the conditional expectation with respect to some norm squared. Does uh, everybody know what this norm here is? Okay, so maybe a little picture here. So we have some function f and we have some other function mu of p. The difference here is this. And now we square all these differences and then integrate. So f minus uh, mu p l2 px squared is nothing else than f minus mu p squared dpx. This is exactly what this picture is about. Well, what does that mean? So, we saw that we want to have a predictor f whose excess risk is small, close to zero. Now, that immediately means that we want to have a predictor for which this norm here is small. And that means, looking at the picture, means that we want to have a predictor which looks like the conditional expectation. So what we really want to have is a predictor which estimates this conditional expectation. And this is what I meant at the very beginning, that whenever we choose a loss function, we actually describe our learning goal. So if we choose the loss function to be the least square loss, we implicitly say we want to estimate the conditional mean. Nothing else. We want to estimate the conditional mean. So this is the naive risk. This is probably not so interesting in this case. There's another formulation of uh, regression. It looks very similar. We again assume that we have some labels, real-valued labels. And now, instead of considering the difference squared, we just consider the absolute value of the difference. Yeah? So the least square loss look like this. And uh, the absolute value looks like this. And again, we want to describe what um, the uh, base risk and the um, base predictors are. And to this end, we need the median, the conditional median. So for the least square loss, we fix the point x and consider the expectation Instead of doing that, we could also fix x and consider the median of this distribution, yeah? which is the point for which we see as many samples above the median as below, yeah? known from school. Um, so we consider this conditional median, and it turns out that using this loss function means that we want to estimate the median. And this is what uh, these two lines tell us. Um, the medians are the only base predictors for this loss function. And whenever we have a sequence Fn for which the excess risk converges to zero, then one can show that 
the corresponding predictors converge to the conditional median in a weak sense. I think I don't uh, want to explain this here in detail. It basically means that not in the strong sense of the L2 norm we get this convergence here, but in a weaker sense. So this means whenever we pick this loss function here, then we, implicit, we implicitly say that our learning goal is estimating the conditional median, nothing else. And so if we compare these two regression problems, we see that depending on the choice of L, we either want to estimate the ex conditional expectation or the conditional median. So we better think before what we actually want to estimate and then pick the loss function accordingly. What we don't want to do is just because of algorithmic reasons, choose the loss function and then let it run, we, sh we need to think about what we want to estimate first. Okay, the naive risk again is uh, this quantity here. So, um, we have seen a couple of uh, examples of uh, the notions we have introduced so far and what we also said is that we want to have predictors for which this excess risk is close to zero and uh, this closeness to zero I like to uh, explain in the next couple of slides what we mean by that. So this is the first way of saying that a learning algorithm actually learns. Yeah? So far we haven't said anything about what we mean by learning. This is the first notion which tells us, okay, in a certain sense, a learning method learns, and it is uh, the following. We fix the learning method and consider the corresponding predictors it produces, and then we say that this learning method is universally consistent if the risk of its predictors FD converge to the smallest possible risk if the sample size goes to infinity. Yeah? Meaning that we just have to wait long enough and we get a predictor whose risk is close to the best possible risk. Yeah? Now, at the very beginning we said that uh, we don't know the distribution P and in order to make sure that for a very particular situation our learning al algorithm actually works well, we need to require that this limit relation holds for every probability measure P. Why? Because if this is true for all probability measures, well then it is definitely also true for this very particular situation we are in. Okay, so this is the notion of universal consistency. Um, what is clear here is that it's purely asymptotic. It doesn't tell us anything how fast it goes. This is the weakness of this notion. But on the other hand, it holds for every distribution P. So, first question, do there exist such methods? And the answer here is yes. And the first result in this direction was uh, published by Stone in 1977. Actually, he showed universal consistency for a couple of uh, different uh, methods, all rather simple uh, in this paper here. And since then, many other learning methods have been shown to be universally consistent. And we will see later on that one particular class of learning algorithms can be made universally consistent. Okay, so the good thing is that, okay, this goal we can achieve. The bad thing is, even if we have a learning algorithm which is universally consistent, we won't know how long we have to wait until we get a good predictor. Yeah? can be almost an eternity. So this leads 
to the second notion of learning, which are learning rates. <coughs> so we say that a learning method learns for a distribution P with a certain rate, which is just a sequence converging to zero, if the expected risk of the predictors constructed of samples from of length n, if this expectation is smaller than or equal the base risk, plus some constant Cp, which may depend on P, and the rate Am. So this is one way of defining learning rates, and one can also consider different notions here in, in the sense that we can consider different uh, notions of uh, convergence. This is one particular notion of convergence, but we can consider different ones here as well. Okay, so even if we have a learning method which learns for a distribution P with the rate AN, we still don't know how long we have to wait because the constant Cp is definitely unknown to us. <laughs> yeah? So this is not even the right notion to tell us how long we have to wait, yet we can't achieve this for all distributions. And this is probably the second very fundamental theorem of learning theory, a result by De Vroy, published in 1982, which says basically the following. Whenever we have an input set x, which is not finite, yeah, even if it's just the natural numbers, it works. But in particular, if we have x to be the real numbers or some rd subset, and we have at least two, sam uh, two labels, if we only have to predict one label, we can always get rates because we know the label we have to predict. Yeah? <laughs> so we need at least two labels. And we also need a non-trivial loss. And this basically means that the loss should be able to distinguish between these two labels and the predictions. Yeah? If the loss doesn't care about what we predict, of course we can get rates. We know how to do that. Yeah? So we need the situation there where we really have to learn the two labels and the input space is not finite. And then this result says that whatever learning rate AN we choose and whatever learning algorithm we choose, we find a distribution which for which this learning method cannot learn with this rate. Even if we allow this constant CP to depend on P. Meaning that, though we would like to know how long we have to wait, we can never, we can never know. There's no chance, there's no way to, to let us know how long we have to wait until we are close to the base risk. This is pretty unfortunate. <laughs> um, yeah, so what happens, last remark, what happens if this assumption is not true. So if these are not true, well, this is easy. I already mentioned that the learning then is uh, straightforward. But what happens if we have a finite set X and then, well, the result is basically that uh, we just have to, well, we can actually estimate how long we have to wait, but the constant CP usually depends on the size of X in a very bad way. In particular, if our space X is not very small, we really have to wait long. Yeah. Any questions so far? <laughs> okay. So, whenever we deal with a finite input set X, um, we can actually get rates, and the easiest way to get these rates is the following. We just consider each point in X uh, independently and just count the number of 
and just have a look at the number of labels which have the same point x and then make for e all of these points x uh, the problem independently. Yeah, so for example, if we want to do classification on a finite set x, we fix one point x, count the number of labels we see with positive label and with negative label, and then just pick the majority. So if we see more positive labels than negative, we choose to predict positive labels. And we do that for all the points in X, and it can be shown that this method is actually uh, A, universally consistent, and also gets rates. And the corresponding rates are of the form O of uh, square root 1 over square root of n. And this is more or less a direct consequence of some of the results later on we will see. But the size here really matters. Okay. So, if we can't get learning rates for all distributions, the next natural thing is uh, to ask, okay, if we can't get it for all, maybe we can get it for certain sets of distributions. And intuitively, yes, we can. For example, if the set of distributions we consider is just consisting of one particular distribution, then of course we can get rates because we know the distribution. So the question is, can we find big sets of distributions for which we can get rates? And this is uh, formalized in this definition here. We pick a set of distributions, script P, and then we say that a learning method learns the set of distributions with a rate if this uh, inequality holds. And this is exactly the same inequality we have seen uh, on the previous slide. And now that we have this notion of r learning with a certain rate for set P, we can also ask, okay, if we find a learning method which learns with rate AN, is this rate AN the best we can get? And this is uh, the following additional definition here. We say that the rate AN is optimal if, in addition, we can't find another learning algorithm which learns faster. Yeah? So an optimal rate is the rate uh, which cannot be improved. This is basically it. And, uh, of course, then what we want to do is, given a set of distributions, we want to find a learning algorithm which learns with the optimal rate for this set of distributions. Um, so here are the two tasks. First, we have to find interesting classes P, and that means that we have to be somewhat convinced that maybe they describe the reality we don't know. And then for these realistic classes of distributions, we need to find algorithms which achieve the optimal rates. And of course, this one here is purely subjective. Yeah? There's no way of objectively uh, describing what realistic classes of distributions are. This is uh, something we have to hope that it is the right intuition we have. Okay, so here's an example, which is uh, considered in the statistical literature. We consider the uh, unit cube in RD, consider labels between minus 1 and 1, and the least square loss. And um, I guess most of you don't know what a Zubolev space is. This is basically a set of functions for which we can compute a certain number of derivatives, and these derivatives are bounded in a certain way. Yeah? So we consider sets of functions which are sufficiently smooth, and the smoothness is described by this integer m. And then we consider distributions for which the uh, 
base predictor, that is the conditional expectation, is smooth in this sense here. Yeah? So this means that we assume that our conditional expectation we want to estimate is smooth up to the order m in this very particular sense. And then a classical result says that uh, the optimal rate is this one. Yeah? And what we see here is that the larger m is, the closer this exponent gets to 1, meaning that we can learn better, but if d is large, this exponent may be small unless m is extremely large. Yeah? So better smoothness means better learning, larger dimensions mean worse learning. Yes? Um, in this constant here, which is uh, not really uh, of importance here. So if we consider these uh, functions, then in this space we have again a norm, which is basically the L2 norm of the derivatives here, and we assume that these norms are bounded by k, and uh, then we just consider functions for which these norms are bounded by k. And the rate may depend, uh, is, a, is a notion which is independent of a constant, because uh, previously we have this uh, constant anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah? These constants uh, do disappear. Okay, so if you go to the statistical literature, you see that uh, there are various learning algorithms which actually achieve this optimal rate. But if you look a little closer, they, many of them at least, require us to know the smoothness in advance. Well, how can we do that? I mean, how do we know how smooth our target is? <laughs> Yeah, so we can get this rate, but only if we know the smoothness is in advance. But this is really not satisfying, and therefore um, we need a notion which uh, gets rid of this. And this is uh, adaptivity. So usually, instead of having just one set of distributions we have an entire family of distributions. And this, in the case on the of the previous slide, this parameter theta would be the smoothness, m. Yeah? And uh, the sets of distributions in that case would be the ones for which the conditional expectation is smooth in the Sobolev sense. Yeah? So we have an entire family of sets of distributions. Each set has its own optimal rate usually different for different values of theta. And we do not know whether our distribution p is in one of these sets, but we hope so. Yeah. In the sense, for example, of the previous uh, example, uh, it would be if we consider least square regression, we hope that the target our conditional expectation is somewhat smooth. We don't know how smooth it is, whether it has just one uh, derivative or 250, but we assume that it is at least somewhat smooth. This is that our distribution is contained in one of these families. Of course, we don't know theta. Yeah? Otherwise, we would be back in the situation of the, of the previous slide. So we don't know theta, and also, we usually have no mean to estimate theta directly. Yeah? Again, how, given a number of samples, how would we uh, come up with a method uh, saying that uh, the conditional mean is so-and-so smooth? We don't know. So we can't 
We don't know whether this theta exists for our p, nor do we have a mean to estimate it. So these are the assumptions for adaptivity. And what our goal then is that we want to have learning algorithms which, again, are universally consistent, so they work in the long run, whatever our distribution is. This is a mean to uh, address this concern here. Mm. And if we are lucky, meaning that our p is actually in one of these sets, then the learning rate of the algorithm should be the optimal one, even if we don't know theta. So back to our example, this means, um, there we go, back again. So if we have the family of distributions here, uh, indexed by m, by the smoothness, we want to find an algorithm which learns with this rate even if we don't know m. This is adaptivity, and it turns out this is possible. And we will see later on how it works. Okay. <coughs> okay, so we want to have adaptive uh, learning algorithms. Okay, so then there are two other questions one can find in the literature. One is uh, finite sample estimates, uh, where we try to estimate the risk of a decision functions of a particular learning algorithm, which may have some extra hyperparameters. And we want to e estimate the excess risk by some quantity here. Um, and this quantity needs to be specified by the theorems we develop. And the reason why we want to do that is A, it gives us usually a way to find uh, a method to make the learning algorithm universally consistent. Namely, if we have a sequence lambda n for which this quantity converges to zero, then we just use this sequence here for the sample size and we see the right-hand side converges to zero, therefore the left-hand side converges to zero and therefore the method is universally consistent. Also, if we know the value of this uh, quantity, uh, we immediately get learning rates. Yeah? The learning rate is just described by this epsilon. And also, what we will see later on is that estimates of this form gives us a device to make learning algorithms adaptive. So at the very heart of everything which we will see later on lies such finite sample estimates. Last but not least, if our input space X is not finite and the other con assumptions of the uh, theorem by Devoy holds, so we have more than two labels and we really want to distinguish between them, then this quantity here must depend on P. Why? If it would be independent of P, we would get learning rates which would hold for all P. But these are impossible. So all these estimates we have to look for must depend on P. There's no way around uh, finding estimates. Uh, yeah, there's no way to find estimates uh, which are independent of P. Unfortunate, but this is as it is. Yes, please. Yes, because uh, univ so the question was uh, if we have a particular learning rate for a particular distribution, um, is the uh, learning algorithm then universally consistent? So it is consistent for that very particular distribution, 
because it converges, the excess risk converges to zero. And if for all distributions we find a learning rate, then it is universally consistent. And vice versa, if we have a universally consistent learning algorithm, of course, that convergence has a certain rate for all distributions p. Yeah? So, yes, yes. So, for a universally consistent uh, algorithm, the uh, convergence rate must depend on p. Unli unless we are in this uh, situation that we only have finitely many x. Okay. So, the last question you can find in the literature uh, asks a somewhat different question. It asks for an estimate of the true risk of our predictor by the performance of our predictor on the data set D. So, at the very beginning, I told you that uh, we don't really care how well our data how well our predictor works on the training set, we only care about its performance on the future data. So, in this very particular question, uh, this is not really true. Indeed, we do care about how well it works on the data set D. Namely, we want to find an estimate, epsilon, such that the true risk of our predictor can be bounded by the empirical risk of the data set plus some uh, error term, epsilon. And this, and the question here is that we want to find an estimate which is independent of p, so that we can get a certain guarantee of how well we have done in the future, or how well we will do in the future, considering our performance in the past. And in order to get that, we need, of course, something independent of p, because we don't know p. So there are plenty of results in this direction. I will not talk about them here in this talk. Um, maybe just uh, two little remarks. Once one has found such an inequality, it can be used to derive parameter selection strategies for lambda. And one of these uh, strategies is uh, structural risk minimization. You may have heard about it. Um, but there's also an alternative, and that is just use the second data set, D prime, and estimate this unknown risk by the empirical risk on this second data set, D prime. If you don't have a second data set, well, just take your data set at hand and split it. If you only have 100 samples, then this may be risky because 100 samples is already pretty small and just uh, splitting it makes it worse. But nowadays, one often has huge numbers of samples and then just splitting it isn't really hurting at all. Maybe it even helps you because uh, you won't be able to process the entire data set at all anyway. Yeah? So. Instead of considering these questions, you could also consider, consider just a, a, a splitting approach. And we will see, actually, that this splitting approach, together with the finite sample estimates, usually lead to adaptive procedures, if you do it right. Okay, so summary of this part here. What do we mean if we want, uh, when we say we look for a good learning algorithm in a learning theoretical sense, well, of course, it needs to be universally consistent, meaning that it should do the right thing in the long run, whatever our distribution p is, and it should also be adaptive for realistic classes of distributions. Yeah? And what re realistic is, this is uh, open to you. These are two constraints of a good learning algorithm, but of course there are more. Third, so we have seen that a learning scenario is described by a loss function. Sometimes uh, we have a learning uh, algorithm for, for a very particular loss function, but uh, our problem at hand requires a different loss function. So it would be very handy if we have some sort of a generic approach in which we can choose the loss function rather freely. Yeah? 
so that we can find something which works not only for one particular loss function but for a huge variety of different losses in the hope that uh, this will cover most of the problems we will ever see. And these things are just of theoretical nature and uh, you have seen that there is always uh, this kind of constant involved so you never really know how the theory will never really tell you how well you have done actually so what you actually need is also a good record on real world problems yeah? you can come up with uh, algorithms which work well extremely which work extremely well uh, theoretically but uh, don't do much uh, in practice should run efficiently on a computer yeah after all we want to run it and there are, depending on the situation usually pl plenty more constraints of a good learning algorithm so if we consider this and this so one open question of course is so if we do all the theory and then eventually we still have to make experiments what is this theory good for well the theory is good for that the hope is that it will guide us to construct the right learning algorithms yeah i mean you can think of a huge universe of possible learning algorithms and uh, considering all the publications in the last couple of years that uh, this universe actually does exist <laughs> um, but the question is which ones for which ones we understand what they do and giving a new situation how can we come up with learning algorithms for which we do understand what they do and this is what theory is about is a guidance of how to avoid stupid mistakes and crossing fingers that it works in practice. Okay, yes, please. That's a, that's a controversial question, actually, because the question is, uh, for what distribution does it not work? Is it just a very exotic one, mathematically existent, but, ra but most likely not relevant for practice? Then you're usually fine. If it also works not for some distributions which seem to be more realistic, then you may have a, question, uh, a problem. Yeah? So the notion of universal consistency is just a mean to avoid saying what we mean by realistic at this very first stage. Later on, when talking about rates, we need to talk about what we mean by realistic. But uh, the notion of, universally, of universal consistency avoids this discussion at this point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, the point, the point re really is, so all this is not about solving one particular problem. It's about designing future algorithms for a variety of different problems. So whenever you are just have one particular application at hand and you just need to solve this very particular application, the theory won't tell you that much. Yeah? Because you have all these constants uh, depending on the distribution you don't know. Yeah? And there comes the art in it. But if your goal is to do more kind of a fundamental research, meaning coming up with new algorithms which work for a huge variety of different uh, uh, applications, then this is what you should consider. It's not about solving one particular application. It's about finding the new algorithms. And in many applications, I mean, eventually boils down to that uh, if you just work hard enough on the very characteristics of the distribution you're, fa you're dealing with, uh, 
then you can come up with certain heuristics which may actually outperform any generic learning algorithm. Yeah? But uh, just work for this very particular data set. Okay, so now we go to learning theories long year favorite, empirical risk minimization. This is uh, the method which uh, was mentioned somewhat in a question asked earlier. So the idea basically is that if we can't compute the risk of a predictor, but we can estimate it from data, why don't we minimize the empirical risk instead? And this is exactly what empirical risk minimization does. Yeah? So we s fix a set of functions and then say that a learning method whose predictors FD minimize the empirical risk. These are called empirical risk minimizers. Yeah? And um, a few remarks. Not every set of functions uh, allows to construct empirical risk minimization because this minimum may not be attained. If it is attained, it is in general not uniquely attained. So there are a couple of different empirical risk minimization algorithms. And last but not least, for certain combinations of F and L, this may be computational infeasible. A uh, classical example is if you consider the set of uh, linear decision functions and binary classification, then it can be shown that solving this optimization problem is NP-hard. Nonetheless, it is a good starting point for uh, um, theoretical investigations, and what I will do now in the last few minutes is to illustrate that it has some issues we must address. And the first one is the danger of underfitting. So underfitting is some, probably some concept you have seen in one way or the other uh, previously. Um, here in this very particular um, case, it means the following. So empirical risk minimization can never produce predictors whose risks are smaller than the smallest possible risk in the, dis in the set of functions we consider. Yeah? Because the functions empirical risk minimization produces lie, by definition, in this set of functions. So the corresponding risks we can produce cannot be better than this one. So if this quantity is far away from the base risk, well, empirical risk minimization does underfit. And here is a simple example. We consider the least square loss, the uh, unit interval, and the uniform distribution on the unit interval as, um, as, um, as the input space. And then consider um, um, conditional expectation, because we deal with the least square loss, which is not linear. So for example, this line here. yeah. And then because uh, we, consi we consider the set of linear functions as the set of predictors, then we see that predicting a nonlinear function with a linear one isn't a good idea, and therefore this risk is greater than the base risk. Yeah? So in this sense, empirical risk minimization in this very particular case uh, underfits and cannot be consistent. Yeah? We will never be better than this quantity. If this quantity is strictly greater than this one, we cannot approach this one. And overfitting, last but not least, um, if the set of functions script F we choose is too large, well, then certain empirical risk minimization procedures may overfit. And again, here is an example of that situation. So we have the same situation. We deal with the least square loss. The set of input samples is uh, the unit interval. We consider the uniform distribution. And 
now our um, conditional expectation is just the constant one function. Yeah? We want to estimate this one. And we use empirical risk minimization over the set of all functions. Okay. And here's one particular empirical risk minimizer. What does it? So if we have a point xi with some label yi, this decision function of this predictor fd predicts this value here. fd of xi is by definition yi. And if we are somewhere which is not covered by a particular sample xi, we predict zero. So we have a couple of uh, x1, x2, maybe x10 points where we make a prediction and everywhere else we predict by zero. Now, predicting the constant one function by a function which is almost everywhere constant to zero isn't a good idea, meaning that we get a big risk of one. But because in the samples we always predict our observation, our empirical error is zero. And therefore, this predictor is a predictor produced by, by one particular empirical risk minimization procedure. And this one just basically memorizes the labels and doesn't say anything about the future. And this one heavily overfits. Okay, so what we will talk about uh, this afternoon is uh, how we can actually analyze empirical risk minimization in order to make sure uh, that it works and also how we can extend empirical risk minimization to procedures we will we see in the literature. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Maybe, maybe I can start. Um, so uh, the, when you talk about consistency, you always talk about this uh, convergence to the base risk. Now, in um, just want to make sure that people don't get confused. If they, for instance, look at uh, Vladimir Wapnik's books, they will find a different notion of consistency. That's maybe right. you can comment a bit on that and give people some context. OK, so roughly speaking, roughly speaking, uh, the notion uh, considered by Wapnik is a relative one. So rather than, so what we have here is uh, we consider empirical risk minimization and we have this risk here which is uh, just the best risk we can obtain by functions in our set of functions and another notion of consistency is that we want to find predictors which are close to this quantity. Yeah? So we want to have RLP FD minus this, that this other excess risk converges to zero. Yeah? So what is, what is the relationship between this notion of consistency and uh, the one I was talking about? Well, if this one is actually equal to the base risk. Both notions are the same. But if this is not the case, they're different. And the one I was talking about is the stronger one because it doesn't tell us anything about F. And this notion I was talking about is also algorithm independent. This notion here is a notion which only makes sense that I start with a set of, uh, set of functions. If I have something else for which I don't really have a set of functions at the very beginning, this notion doesn't make sense. So this one is a notion related to empirical risk minimization and uh, things built on top of that. 
This one is a notion which is algorithm independent. More questions? Including the other room. Uh, here are no questions. There is a question. So this is slide number 10, and you are referring to? OK. Ah, no, this means that this, fun this is a function, and we consider the case where this function is everywhere greater than a half or everywhere smaller than a half. Yeah? Point-wise, this is, of course, <laughs> always satisfied. <laughs> yes. But it but uh, in general, this eta is at some areas greater than a half and in some areas smaller than a half. And then, of course, this is not true. <laughs>